Merkel Media. This was all circulating around the base that a giant had been killed, but no one was supposed to talk about it. I saw three long bony fingers reach up underneath the door, curl up to grab it, and then disappear. When he came over to me, dude, he slithered over to me. And this giant comes out of the cave and they're all frozen. And he starts running and firing at this giant. Well, the giant moves. He's got a spear in one hand and he's running really fast and spears Dan and holds him up like this. Somebody else, shoot him in the face, shoot him in the face. They basically decapitate him. Got closer, got closer, got closer. When he got about 15 yards away from me, I raised that 12 gauge and I blow his head off. I feel something pulling at my leg. And I look over and there are two small gray entities pulling it. And they're literally, I'm getting pulled off the bed. I reach my hand into this bush and I touch air. Couldn't breathe and I couldn't move because I know I'm seeing a monster. You're listening to The Confessionals. I am your host, Tony Merkel. Thank you for being here. If you've had an encounter or a story you'd like to share with me on the show, go ahead and shoot me that email. My email address is theconfessionalspodcast at gmail.com. That's theconfessionalspodcast at gmail.com. Or go to the website, theconfessionalspodcast.com. Hit the connection section and you can reach me that way as well. Either way works for me. Just get a hold of me. Now let's get into the Art Bell iTunes five-star ratings and reviews. This is for anybody who goes to iTunes and leaves a five star rating or review, you get a shout out on the following week's show. And this week's shout outs is Eliana Renovato, Tiger Tail 22, Machine Made God 14, Lumberzack 88, YG05, Saints Got Robbed, yes they did, Kerry Kentucky, Mike Stewart 72, Kimberly Gale, Laquita, Mary Luisa, Leah Roses, B Kingy 32, and rounding it off, JPD 6261. Thank you very much for going to iTunes and leaving that five star rating or review. It helps the show grow on iTunes, and that is a big deal for me. So thank you very much. Patreon now. Let's get the Patreon shout outs. This is for anybody who goes to patreon.com forward slash the confessionals and signs up to become a patron to help. I mean, he's 23 years old. How busy can it be? But then I said, dude, what about Monday night? Let's just record before we have to put the show out on Tuesday. And he's like, nah, man, I really can't. So let's just back the buses up right now over Jack because he let us down. Sorry, Jack. I had to do it. Anyways, so I couldn't bring Jack on the show. So I had to bring on the JV squad here. We, we're bringing on Wes Germer from Sasquatch Chronicles. Wes, how you doing, man? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. A little, uh, a little harsh playing second fiddle to Jack. If I'd have had that piece of information, I wouldn't have been sober for this. But um, no, I'm doing good, man. I'm doing good. Glad to <laughs> second place. Yeah, Fantastic. man. <laughs> Well, listen, guys, we're going to be talking about some time traveler stuff with Wes tonight. But before we get into the time traveler stuff, and we got a lot of time traveler stuff to go over. Actually, we have a couple of accounts to go over. Uh, and this is something that Wes and I aren't uh, strangers to when it comes to talking to each other about this weird stuff. Because when Wes and I talk, we wind up talking a lot about weird news, a lot of time traveler, Wes. We talk a lot about time traveling together. But anyways, before we bring that up, I wanted to bring it to your attention, guys, that for the very first time, we're going to be doing a live show. Wes and I are going to be doing a live show down in the Houston, Texas area. We're going to be joined with Twisted Philly and Hillbilly Horror Stories. That's right. So on May 11th, 2019 at 7 p.m., we're going to be going live down in Houston, Texas at a place called Cisco Salsa Company. If you're interested in purchasing tickets for this event, go to my website, theconfessionalspodcast.com, hit the live events tab that we just made. And on that page, you'll see where you can buy tickets for the Houston show down in Texas. Once again, this is a show with me, Sasquatch Chronicles, Twisted Philly, and Hillbilly Horror Stories. We're going to have a great time down there. It's going to be a great opportunity for you to come out, meet me, meet Wes. It's going to be a great time for everybody. So I highly recommend you come out and watch us do our shows live in person and get to shake our hands. Wes, are you excited about this? Yeah, I'm pretty excited about it. I like that it's a smaller event, smaller venue, and I uh, get a chance to meet the fans. And, and I'm going to be bringing Bob Gimlin out with me. So we'll, Bob and I will be doing the show live on stage and 
probably hang out with the audience afterwards. Yeah, absolutely. It's going to be a great time and bringing Bob down is going to be awesome. Uh, And that's what I wanted to mention too, that it is only 100 seats available. So don't wait on getting your tickets. If you think you want to do this, hop on it fast because these 100 seats are going to sell really fast. So if you're interested and you're within a five hour radius of Houston, Texas, I highly recommend you make the road trip out to this live show and meet me and Wes in person. So now that we got the promotions out of the way, Wes, we got some time traveler talk to go on tonight. So you and I were talking about some of these different things that uh, pertain to time travel. And we're going to start off with this Baron Trump Donald Trump, John G. Trump, time traveler with Nikola Tesla mixed in there. Wes, you and I talked about it a little bit, and I know that uh, you don't know a ton about it, but you know enough to hold a conversation. So I'm just going to kind of go over this information, and I want to hear what you have to say about some of this, because there are a lot of similarities to this story that, you know... When you first heard about it, because when I first heard about it, I was thinking, okay, yeah, whatever. It's one of those uh, tweaker conspiracy theories that they were just bored one night and they decided to drum up something. But it turns out that a lot of this stuff is based off of facts. And so I'm just going to run through some of this stuff. So apparently there is a book that was written in 1893 called Baron Trump's Marvelous Underground Journey. Now, this is a real book. It's actually in the Library of Congress. So this this book is 100% legit. And in this book, Baron Trump is... The, in the book, it's called Baron Trump's Marvelous Underground Journey. And the name Baron is spelled B-A-R-O-N. Well, Donald Trump's son's name is Baron and it's spelled B-A-R-R-O-N. So you're like, okay, it's a similarity there. And that's where I was kind of at. I was like, okay, whatever. You know, <laughs> like, I'm not, I'm not going to buy this. In fact, when I first saw this, I really didn't pay much attention to it until I had somebody post it on my page and I started looking at it. So when you start looking at this a little bit deeper, you actually look at the picture. Now, there's a picture on this book's uh, page of the sketch of the little boy, Baron Trump. And Baron Trump in the book, is a striking resemblance to the president's son, Baron Trump. And I actually put the uh, comparison photo on the website for people to check out. So you have this little kid, his name is Baron Trump in the book, and he lives in guess what? Trump Castle, which is a obvious resemblance to Trump Tower, which Donald Trump owns in New York City. And speaking of Donald Trump, in the book, Baron Trump has a like master mentor kind of guy. And guess what his name is? Don. So he has this mentor named Don. And apparently this book took place in Russia. And there's a similarity there. It might be pulling a little bit as straws. But, you know, Melania Trump is from Russia. So his mother, Melania, is a Russian. And so it's like that comparison right there. So there's these similarities with just the names and things like that in this book called Baron Trump's Marvelous Underground Journey. But the similarities don't end there. So this book was written by a guy named Ingersoll Lockwood. And Ingersoll Lockwood wrote a sequel to this book called The Last President. He wrote that sequel in 1896. So these books were written like 130 years ago. And in this book, the last president. It's based off of this guy who is a wealthy businessman who runs for president. He's a wealthy business. Let me say this. He's a wealthy businessman based out of New York City. He runs for president. He wasn't expected to win, but he wins anyways. When he wins in a shocking win, there's upset, there's riots, there's protests. It sounds a lot like the 2016 elections, if you ask me. So you have this whole similarity here. So Donald Trump has his Trump Towers on Fifth Avenue in New York City, right? Well, in the book, this wealthy businessman lived on Fifth Avenue in New York City. And we're going to come back to the whole Fifth Avenue angle because it actually ties into a story you're going to be talking about here in a few minutes, Wes. Uh, But the similarities, I think, at this point are kind of like, okay, it's kind of getting a little weird, a little spooky, but it gets a little bit deeper because when this person in the book wins the election to be president, he starts picking his cabinet members. And for his secretary of agriculture, he picks a guy named LaFay Pence. And so we know that the vice president of the United States is Mike Pence. And in the book, he picks a secretary of agriculture named LaFay Pence. And so at this point, Wes, let me ask you before I go any further, is this just a crackpot conspiracy theory? Is there any kind of uh, similarities here that I, am I just drawing at pulling at something or is this something that you're saying that's nah, interesting? 
No, I think it's definitely interesting. I mean, there's um, it reminds me of um, well, I guess this is a bad example, but like The Simpsons. Have you ever looked at the predictions of The Simpsons? Yeah, it's spooky. And someone sent it to me, and I was like, ah, oh, come on. And then I started watching, and I was like, holy crap, holy crap, holy crap. And then I was like, Matt Groening, the guy that created The Simpsons, time traveler. I mean, there's some weird things that he comes up with. So it is interesting. Could be a coincidence with the book. I don't know. I don't, um, I'm not sure. Yeah, so let me just give you a little bit more information here, because it gets a little bit deeper here. Now, uh, Nikola Tesla, you know, famous inventor, very smart man. And at one point, apparently he claimed to have built a time machine. And upon his death, the government comes in underneath the name of, uh, I guess this department was called the Office of Alien Property. If you look it up on Google, there's actually a Wikipedia page. I guess it's a real department. But they seized all his notes and his inventions and they started going through things and trying to make sense of what, you know, this guy's mind was made of, you know? And a lot of the stuff they couldn't really figure out. And so they had to bring in an outside engineer, somebody who wasn't working for the government but really knew his stuff, and they wanted to have this guy come in, check out the notes, check out the machines and see if he could make sense of anything. Well, that guy, the outside engineer, his name is John G. Trump. It was Donald Trump's uncle. So Donald Trump's uncle is this outside engineer that gets brought in to check out Nikola Tesla's inventions and all his notes. And his conclusion is that he didn't find anything that was uh, suspicious or something that the military could use. It was just like, oh, yeah, this is interesting stuff. And so, yeah, (laughs) yeah. I mean, at that point, it's like, okay, we're talking about one of the smartest guys who ever lived. And he's just like, yeah, it was all nothing. Yeah. Nothing to see here. Go ahead and put that time machine in my trunk and kill a hooker in the back and we're out of here, fellas. <laughs> exactly. <I> mean, <laughs> nothing of interest. You know, Nikola Tesla, he's just a normal guy. There's nothing around here lying around that could be of use to humanity. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's just like, come on, really? So apparently, John G. Trump didn't find anything. And the theory is that he did find something. He found Nikola Tesla's either his notes on how to build his time machine or the actual time machine, and that he took those notes or the machine, built it for himself, and used it. And so from there, people have been stra- drawing uh, comparisons to the John Teeter uh, character from the early 2000s. Now, we just did a little bit of a segment on that last week's show where my wife, she wrote a blog and David Halevi from the Jew and Gentile podcast, uh, he narrated it. And a lot of people seem to like that. And I just found it interesting that they brought up John Teeter for this conspiracy theory. And they're just saying, they're suggesting that maybe either John Trump or Donald Trump or Baron Trump, maybe, or maybe all three of them are John Teeter. And John Teeter was actually talking in the early 2000s, predicting the future of what was going to happen. Because if you remember the John Teeter story, he talks about, I think it was in 2004, he was talking about all the civil unrest that's going to come. Uh, he just, he essentially described the 2016 elections and he described the aftermath of it. And it, it was, a very eerie similarity from what he described to what happened in 2016, but it wasn't 2004, like he said it was going to happen. But he also said in his timeline that when you do time travel, the timeline varies a little bit. Like I think he said two and a half percent or something like that. So would that account for the difference in years? I don't know. But there are people who say that maybe this John Teeter character is actually a Trump, either coming forward and trying to save humanity or maybe ruin humanity. It depends on if you hate Trump or love Trump, right? So, and I don't care either way, but I found that whole thing very uh, interesting. This whole thing that popped up on the internet this past week. And now apparently it was actually originally put up in 2017, but it really didn't gain traction. And all of a sudden it's gaining traction. And when you look at this though, it's just, it's very interesting, whether it's factual or not, I don't care. I mean, as far as like the idea of him being a time traveler, obviously the book's real and things like that. There's a lot of factual things within this story. Is it coincidence? I don't know, but I do find it interesting. Yeah. It's hard to say. It's hard to say. I think like I was telling you before, I think everyone's interested in time travel. I think it's a part of our humanity that we have an interest in time travel. I mean, let's face it. We're all dying, some dying quicker than others, but we're all dying 
And the one thing that we haven't been able to really control is time. And I remember there was, there was this one thing uh, when I first started looking into some of these time traveler claims. And, and to be honest with you, I think 90% of them, 99% of them are nonsense. Uh, but there was a guy, I, was, I, I read his whole story, watched the whole thing on him. And he was, um, his dad was in, um, his dad was actually a part of the CIA. And he was a part of this secret program. And um, this guy's telling this whole story about time travel and how you don't really control where you go. You just kind of end up in moments in time. And he went through his whole explanation on it. And when you come down to it, science and physics, time travel is actually possible. But he's telling this story about time traveling and being a part of the secret program. And then he goes, um, uh, I have proof. So then he pulls out this this photo. And the photo, um, I was shocked because, you know, these guys never have proof. Um, there was a photo that was taken back at Gettysburg, and there's a bunch of people waiting for the president to come up, and the guy was snapping pictures. And it's an actual picture. You can go look in the, look it up in the archives. It's not like he just came up with it. And there's just one guy in the photo that does – he looks like he doesn't belong. He's not dressed right. He just – he looks out of place. And it looks like a guy from the future standing and posing for a picture back in the 1800s. Or, and it's just this weird picture. But uh, he goes, that's me. And he goes, I, when I went back, I stood in front of the camera. That's me. And everyone's like, ah, come on. So they pulled up pictures of, of this guy when he was about the same age. It's the same guy. I mean, literally, you could line these pictures up. It's the same freaking guy. I know pictures doesn't prove anything. But what I'm saying is he's got this impressive military career. He has this impressive government career and why would he so he came up with the time traveling story wrapped around some picture he found in the archives that kind of looked like him seems bizarre that almost seems more odd than he actually traveled through time you know what i mean yeah. uh, but when you start looking into some of these cases there there's a lot to some of these things man where you walk away and go i don't know what to think about that yeah and that's the thing i mean like when i talk about time travel to anybody i always tell them like if time travel is possible, then it always has been possible. It, it's like once you get into the timeline of the original existence, whatever that is, right? And somebody discovers time travel and they start utilizing it. At that point, at that point, time travel has always existed and it always has been used because that person going in and out of time, it's like it's really trippy when you start thinking about it. And I found it really interesting where in the original story that I just shared about the Trumps and all that stuff, you had the guy in the book who was a wealthy businessman who had who had lived on Fifth Avenue. And Trump Tower is on Fifth Avenue, both in New York City. Now, the story that you brought to my attention not too long ago about Rudolph Fence, his story all starts on Fifth Avenue in New York City. What is it about Fifth Avenue? Is there like some kind of time portal on Fifth Avenue? Should we go up to Fifth Avenue and check it out right now? I don't know, but it's freaking me out. <laughs> It's bizarre, man. I mean, that Rudolph Fence story is very bizarre. And there's a lot to his story. And the more you dig into Rudolph Fence, the more you start realizing there's something. I mean, this is just weird. You know, at face value, well, there, here's a Rudolph Fence story, if you want me to go into it. Go for it. Everyone's probably like, what's this guy talking about? Um, the Rudolph Fence story. In 1951, uh, New York City, this guy appears out of nowhere. And he's dressed like he's from the 1800s. And he looks way out of place. Witnesses at the time that saw this guy said he just showed up. He came up out of nowhere. And he was dressed funny. He was acting strange. Uh, he was he was terrified of the lights of the city and the cars going by and the noise. It was almost like putting a wild animal in downtown New York. That's how this guy acted. He was just terrified. Well, he runs out into traffic and gets hit by a taxi cab, and it kills him. So they take Rudolph Fence to um, the morgue, and they're trying to figure out, okay, who is this guy? Why is he dressed funny? And they found um, a token for a beer um, on Fifth Avenue to a bar that didn't exist anymore. They found a receipt on him from a place that where he had his um, his horse carriage cleaned, on Fifth Avenue that doesn't exist anymore. And they also found a bunch of cash on him. And so he just shows up and no one really knows who this guy is. They don't know where he came from. Bizarre story. Went all over the newspapers and no one knew anything about this guy. No one could figure out who this guy was. 
Well, a couple of years later, a detective picked up the story and started looking into it. And when he started looking into it, his main reason for looking into it was to debunk the whole thing. Say some guy at the newspaper came up with this cockamamie story. So he starts investigating it. Come to find out, he found Rudolph Fence Jr., um, according to this guy's son, um, not far from New York City. So he goes to pay him a visit. And he gets there, and Rudolph Fence Jr. had passed away. He had died. And it was his widow that was there. So the detective goes in, starts talking to the widow, and is like, tell me about your husband and, you know, all the normal pleasantries to get to where he wants to go with this conversation. And then he asks him, well, tell me about uh, Rudolph Fence Jr.'s father. What, what about his father? And she said, yeah, he, he was um, he disappeared in the 1800s. He left that. And when Rudolph Fence Jr. Had passed away, he was like 70. Um, and she goes, yeah, the the um, senior had left the house middle of the night and he was going out for a stroll and he never came back. And the whole family assumed he had been murdered. And they said, well, how old was he when he when he left? She goes, I don't know, 29, 30 years old. He was pretty young. He just he left one night, never came back. No one ever knew what happened to him. Well, fast forward to 1951. This guy that gets hit by the taxi cab was about 29, 30 years old, dressed like he's from the 1800s. And on one of the documents, his name, Rudolph Fence, was on there. And I'm telling you, the more you kind of dig into it, I've there's been moments where I've looked into this and walked away and go, ah, oh, it's all nonsense. And then there's other times where I go back and I start looking at different details and you think, I, I don't know what to think about this. I really don't know what to think about this. It's a bizarre story. So, I mean, did he walk out in the forest? There was like light and he walked into light and all of a sudden he was in New York City in 1951. Uh, did some guy at the newspaper dream this up? There's a lot of weird details that don't quite add up to someone just dreaming the story up. Um, so it, it's fascinating. Like I said, I think as humanity, I think all of us are interested in time travel. I really do. Yeah. And I mean, you mentioned about how like he just disappeared and things like that. And we talk about that a lot with like Bigfoot encounters and things like that. I mean, that's an ongoing theme in the Bigfoot world. When you're looking into this, like you come across these stories of people just up and disappearing and we don't know where they went. And, you know, when that happens in the woods, you start thinking, uh, okay, there's no sign whatsoever. It's like they just disappeared. And you think, okay, could have Bigfoot have done this? And sometimes there are situations where you hear about uh, somebody talking about how uh, the kid came back. And when they talked to the kid, he was with a bear or something like that. And you start thinking Bigfoot. But then there's other times that there's just no clues. Like the person's just gone. And it's just like, well, was there like some kind of weird time slip portal thing that happened? Some kind of glitch in the quote unquote matrix? Yeah, you, you just don't know. But uh, these are things that actually happen where people disappear and we don't know what happens to them. And you have stories like you just shared and the one I shared where the one I share is a lot of uh, conjecture. But there's everything that I share with you is facts. John G. Trump, very real person. The book is a very real thing. Like these are real facts. And it's like, is it just coincidence or is that real? And so there's a lot of different things here that just make you scratch your head and like, am I living in bizarre world? You know? Yeah. And I, and I think time travel is abs- I, I think it's possible. Um, I think through physics and I think through mathematics and science, I actually think time travel is possible. No doubt in my mind that it's possible. And I think sometimes we kind of experience that a little bit too. Like I've always wondered about deja vu. And we don't have to go too much into this, but deja vu is a very bizarre thing that ha- what happens when you get deja vu? You have this moment where you almost feel out of place because you've been there before. You're saying the exact same thing you've said before. You've been there. You've lived that moment already. And everyone has experienced deja vu. And I, and to this day, I've never heard one great explanation except for the Matrix, what you mentioned, how they explained deja vu, how it was like a glitch. And that's I mean, that makes more sense than any other explanation I've heard. But it's a real weird phenomenon that goes on with people where you get this deja vu and you feel like I've been here before. I've experienced this before. And it can be in a place you've never been. And you're like, I've been here before. We've had this conversation. Um, But I guess that's a side note. Yeah, well, I mean, you mentioned deja vu and you and I experienced it firsthand together uh, twice now. 
in conversation with you, you stop in the middle of conversation. You're like, uh, we've done this before. You had deja vu while we were talking. The one time was here on FaceTime. And the other time we were down in Dallas sitting in your hotel room together. We were going on audio and stuff like we were working on, you know, some audio files and things like that. And you just kind of stopped and you stared off and you're just like, I'm having some serious deja vu. And it lasted like 10 seconds for you. And you're like, it's still happening. Like we were here before we've had this conversation. And that was the first time you and I had ever met in real person. Like we'd never face to face like that. It was spooky, man. I remember it was spooky. It was like we had sat in that room. We were having the exact same conversation we're having. I was even on the computer about ready to close something. And it's like, I've been here before. We've done this before. Like I've had this conversation. It's just bizarre when it happens. It's a creepy feeling. Deja vu is creepy. Yeah, it's 100% creepy. And uh, yeah, man, I'll tell you, this stuff is just, I find it very fascinating. The time travel, deja vu, all this, these glitches that we have in our reality. And it's unexplained. And that's the, the fascinating thing about my show, your show, is that we, we focus on people's real life stories of the unexplainable. And uh, this is just another one where I've been started really getting into time travel. I don't know if people noticed that I've talked about it probably two or three times now in the last few months. And I just, I really love this idea of time travel. I've been having some people talking to me about their experiences with either seeing a time traveler or you know being involved in time travel. And it's just fascinating stuff. So uh, Wes, I thank you for coming on the show here, man, and talking a little bit about time travel and things like that. And next up, we are going to be going into talking to Snuffy. Do you know who Snuffy is there, Wes? No, I'm not sure. Who is it? Who is it? Yeah, Snuffy, he's a local guy to me. He's out here in Pennsylvania. And he, oh, he's the guy that cuts up those trees and makes uh, art. Yes. He does chainsaw stuff. Man, I'd like to see some of his stuff. I heard you talking about him. Sorry, Dimitri. No, it's off. fine. Yeah, he, he does great work and stuff. What he does is he takes trees and with a chainsaw, he carves Bigfoot and stuff. And I mean, it's great stuff. I've seen his stuff for years now. Well, I was talking to him and it turns out he actually has a dog man encounter. And so I was like, dude, we got to talk about this. So I'll, next up here, we have Snuffy. Snuffy, how you doing? Great, Tony. It's good to be with you today. Yeah, man. Listen, uh, I'm a big fan of your artwork. And before we get into your experience and stuff, I wanted to talk about that a little bit because uh, my first exposure to your artwork was at the Ohio Bigfoot Conference. It was my first year out there. It was probably like 2015, 2016. And I see these giant Bigfoot carvings. And I was like, that's really cool. And then I found out you do it with a chainsaw, which is even cooler. How'd you get involved in doing that? Well, in my little town in uh, Ridgeway, Pennsylvania, outside of the inside of the Allegheny National Forest, we have uh, the largest chainsaw uh, carving event in the world, and it's been going on for this is going to be the twentieth year, and I've been carving for about twelve years or eleven years, and I just you know started hanging out with these people. They were artists and musicians, and I was uh, playing guitar back in those days, and uh, just started hanging out and. Next thing you know, I'm a chainsaw carver, making Sasquatches for a living. Yeah, that's incredible, brother. Uh, now, you you carve Bigfoot. Do you carve anything else other than Bigfoot, or is you just a, a Bigfoot carver? I pretty much have carved, you know, you name it, I've carved it from frogs to horses to fish to elephants to all, you know, I tried just about one of everything um, before I got into, you know, making the Bigfoots. <laughs> Now, were you were you a t- were you typically like an artistic person when it came to like you know not music but like you know art like drawing or something like that that you knew you'd be able to do something like this or is this something that you just kind of fell into and you're just like hey I'm pretty good at this? I really fell into it. Um, I just uh, brought a chainsaw girl home from the, the event and. Uh, <laughs> cooked her breakfast in the morning and said, uh, here's a piece of wood, make me something. And she got started on it and she said, oh, you finish this. And next thing you know, making, you know, art for a living. I actually got paddled in uh, about fifth grade for saying art sucks by a female art teacher. <laughs> wow. Oh my, the tables have turned. I, my teachers. Yeah, they, t- they've had to beat it into you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, when I was in school, my teachers would tell me I wouldn't ma- I wouldn't ever make money staring out the window, and here I am being a truck driver. So they were wrong. So <laughs> that's right. You go down the road right now. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I I take the weekends off. I you know need to recoup. But um, so snuff man, I you have 
you're involved in the Bigfoot community and uh, you've never seen a Bigfoot, but I'm assuming you believe in Bigfoot. Uh, I, that's just an assumption, assumption but uh, just judging by your artwork and the fact that I've seen you at Ohio Bigfoot Conference, uh, I'm assuming, you know, at least you believe that they're out there uh, and you've heard the experiences of people, I'm sure, in your area. I mean, yeah, I live in I mean. Western Pennsylvania and... You know, my my good friend, and I know I know you know who he is, Dave Groves. I mean, he had a sighting uh, out in that area, and there's just a lot of stuff. And you have Ohio there, but we're not here to talk about uh, any Bigfoot experiences. You've actually seen uh, a dog man. What was it like two years ago or something like that in in Pennsylvania? Was, right? I think it was like 2016, 2015 summers. One of those two. I can't, didn't really. Uh, Right down at the time, what the date, you know, the date of it, anything is. But, um, so we were actually in the, you know, heading from my little village, um, of Lake City, not the Lake City by Erie, PA, but Lake City in the Allegheny National Forest. Um, we were heading up to Kane, and there's a back road that you can go to. And this, this road goes right through the middle of the Allegheny National Forest. And it actually is right by where Dave Groves had his Bigfoot occurrence. Um, we had just passed the ATV trail, which is where he was riding and saw his Bigfoot. But we got about five miles uh, further up the road to this area that people like to call the seven mile straight stretch. It's still kind of hilly, but it's just a big, long, straight dirt road, kind of, kind of rough with lots of potholes and there was three of us in the car that day, me and my girlfriend and a good friend of mine, Carl. Um, and so we get up to this big straight stretch and we're just cruising along, maybe 35 miles an hour. And um, we come up over this first knoll and up in the distance, I see something on my left and it's, the road's kind of wide. We got about 30 feet of clearing on each side of the road, Tony, and uh, the road's about 30 feet. So we got about 90 feet that we actually witnessed this creature, Dogman, um, which I learned later that it was a, you know, a Dogman. Um, so, you know, it was one of those things where, uh, you know, a creature pops up right in your face and, and you, you know, it's gone in a second or two. This thing walked in front of us for 90 feet and it wasn't running. It wasn't, it didn't pay any attention that we were coming at it, you know, 30 miles an hour, 40 miles an hour down the dirt road. Uh, it never looked at us either, though. And we had all we saw was a side profile, but that side profile gave us a pretty uh, scary look. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Uh, and you're not the only one that saw it, right? I mean, uh, the other people saw it too. Yeah. So me and my my buddy up front, and my girlfriend Cheryl's in the back seat. She's back there knitting, actually. And I, um, you know, first I'm like, "Hey, Carl, you see this, Carl? You know, right away, I, you know, I'll." Both of them have the you know smartphones and these great cameras, but nobody you know we were just like so blown away by this thing we were seeing that you know nobody even thought to get a camera out or anything. So this thing's just like it had this weird gait. It was it was just so bizarre the way it walked, and uh, you know like each foot was in the air touching the ground, and just one foot would touch the ground at a time, and it was just really a bizarre gate. And it, like I said, it wasn't running or anything. It just walked right in front of us. And we're coming, we're, we're still pretty far away. I don't know how, you know, like if we started say a thousand meters and got up to, you know, 200 meters or whatever. But by the time we got up close, it, you know, we could see it pretty, pretty good. Um, this thing looked like, you know, maybe a, the size of great Dane in height. What really threw us off and, you know, made us really wonder what the hell we saw was that it had this, really long tail that came up and curled and you know if it if it was just you know no tail we may you know we could have think it was a mangy bear or something like that but it also had this very elongated snout that just you know looked like it would just rip your throat right off and go eat some more throats because that's all it ate it was just it was a scary looking creature tony wow so did this just look like like a dog standing upright or did, cause sometimes people talk about, you know, dog man, maybe having like more of a human type body, like a, the muscular body and hands instead of, you know, paws. Uh, did you get any good detail as far as that goes? I mean, was this just like a, this was definitely not like a man like creature. In my opinion, it was, it was a more of a dog like thing. Um, some other, um, 
pictures that we did see on the internet that we were trying to t- figure out what the hell we saw was the old, you know, chupacabra type thing. And so they had different, you know, smaller ones, bigger ones. Um, this thing was very muscular, had a big chest, long, le- very long legs. And like I said, that snout was just really scary looking, really long, you know, mouth and and snout on that thing. It was like a a dark brown or a brindle. It didn't look like it had long, really long fur. Um, I was, you know, we weren't close enough to say that it had super short hair, but I could you could tell that it didn't have super long hair. Um, and that tail, the tail, the tail wasn't like fluffy, like a big wolf's tail or anything. It was more, it was skinnier. It didn't have a lot of fur on the tail that we could see, but it just it had that distinctive came up and curled at the end. It was really weird. Yeah. And, and the fact that it really didn't pay you much mind, I mean, uh, do you think that it was focused on something or do you think that maybe it just didn't give a crap that you were there and just did its own thing? To me, it seemed like it just didn't give a shit. And, and you know, when you're, when you're buzzing down a gravel road at 40 miles an hour, you know, it makes a lot of noise. And, you know, we're coming straight at it. And so, I mean, I, like I said, it did not turn. And, you know, we're, we're just staring straight ahead because that's the way we're going. And we're not, you know, we don't have to look to the side to side at all. And so I could see, you know, he just did not turn one, one, one look at us at all. Wow. That, I mean, it's, I find it interesting because I, when I first started doing the Bigfoot stuff back in like 2015 here in Pennsylvania, uh, I started hearing about this dog man and how there's been more and more increasing sightings in Pennsylvania of this thing. And uh, mm-hmm. when I found out that you had that uh, had a sighting in Pennsylvania, I, I definitely wanted to talk to you about it. Uh, it, it. I just find it fascinating. And the fact that you said that it wasn't very far from where Dave Groves had his sighting, I right. find it interesting as well. I mean, the fact that these things are in very similar areas and stuff, uh, people, right. people theorize about how, you know, maybe they, they have, you know, turf beefs and stuff like that. Uh, I just, I find it very fascinating, man. Yeah, I, I was, you know, I've talked to Dave a few times and he actually uh, did get a, one of my big sculptures this year and, uh, we we're talking about it and how, you know, he, he just came off of the ATV trail and we're just passing the one. And so, you know, we're like, well, actually we saw them in the same damn area within, you know, a 10 mile, uh, you know, window there. The other thing is like 15 miles from my own home and, you know, and we used to camp in this area. So like, we don't really want to camp out there anymore. (laughs) (laughs) I can understand that. Uh, I guess, I mean, with it being so close to where you live and stuff, I mean, did it kind of give you any kind of PTSD where it's like, I'm afraid of this area in general now? Well, I wouldn't go that far. Um, you know, we still enjoy the woods and, and, uh, but you know, there's lots of woods being that we're in the Allegheny National Forest, there's lots to look at. So, you know, we can just avoid that area if we don't feel so comfortable about going out there, you know? Yeah. I, I, uh, I think it was about a year and a half ago now. Uh, I was up in, up in the Allegheny National Forest on my way to a conference I was speaking at in New York. And I took a stop because I had somebody tell me that they found a fossilized footprint in a cave. Uh, and it was like about 19 inches long. And I was like, dang. And they gave me coordinates and they said it's about a two mile hike off trail. And so me and my brother went on this hike and we're going up this like giant hill and looking for this cave. And we came across this area where there's tons of boulders and we found caves, but it wasn't the right one. We finally found the cave Mm -hmm. and I I dive in and this is a, it was a really, it was, it wasn't the biggest cave I've ever been in, but it was definitely a spot where if I was out there, I could hunch down in there for days. It was just, it was a nice size. And I get in there and I find the print and it was a fake. It was actually fake. Uh, It was, it was made of cement and it was very heavy. I was able to pull it right out of the ground and uh, I, I just think to myself, who either drags a bag of cement up here or drags this heavy thing two miles off trail? I mean, it was like, it was really, it was far off trail. I mean, I documented it on my, my YouTube channel. I mean, it's like a 45 minute video of us getting up there. But um, Okay, I'll see where, where it was. Yeah, I'll, close you are. I'll definitely check. I'll definitely send it to you. But uh, I, I'm thinking to myself, man, like I had Bigfoot on the brain when I was out there. I never really thought about Dogman. <laughs> I think I would have been more scared of coming across a Dogman than a Bigfoot. 
And that was the whole thing, Tony, because, like, you know, my girlfriend is just obsessed with wanting to see one. She thinks it's going to be the funniest and friendliest thing ever. And, and then and then she's like, oh, we saw this thing. I, we don't want to see that thing. <laughs> Not at all. Not at all. Uh, and you said, all right, so this was close to where Dave had his encounter. Now, you mentioned that you were on the way to Kane. How far were you from Kane? Um, so we were in L County, Highland Township. So you would cross 948, which comes into Ridgeway. And then that also intersects with Route 66. So from, from there to Kane, it would be about, say, um, 12 miles, somewhere around there. Wow. Okay. I, and I asked that because I have a, a child. Maybe 50, you know, between 12 and 17 miles, somewhere in there. Okay, so it's actually not that far. I, I, I oh, have a childhood no. friend uh, that I grew up with out in this area. We grew up in the sticks out here, and he moved out to Kane. And he's a great outdoorsman. I mean, he pretty, pretty much just lives out there year-round. He's doing something right. in the woods. And uh, he doesn't believe in Bigfoot. He doesn't believe in any of this. Mm-hmm. And uh, We talk about it from time to time, and he's like, I'm the kind of guy I got to I gotta see it to believe it and stuff. And I'm thinking to myself, man, right. If Dave Groves had his sighting not too far from there, you had that sighting. Uh, I wonder if Derek's going to eventually one of these days have his experience that's going to be, you know, his come to Jesus moment. So <laughs> uh, it, it might I think happen. a lot of these things. A lot of these things are like you're not looking, though. But, you know, it's Dave wasn't looking. We sure as hell weren't looking for a dog, man. Dave wasn't looking for that Bigfoot. It, I, you know, it's, I'm not saying Pete, you don't see see things when you're out looking, but I think it's when you're not looking that, that you're, you know these things happen yeah it seems to be by accident a lot and uh you know i i I, he's my friend and all but sometimes i you know because he's not out there looking that's for sure he's just out there you know hunting and fishing and all that Mm -hmm. stuff and you know sometimes i i really do wish he would see something just so that you know i have a friend from my childhood that i can talk to about it and stuff right right but uh, cause I've never seen anything. I've never seen dog, man. I've never seen Bigfoot. I'm just, I'm really fascinated by it all. And, uh, I just, you know, I, I really think that your experience and stuff was, uh, was one that I wanted to talk about because it's just, I don't get a chance to talk to a whole lot of people from Pennsylvania that saw a dog, man. I mean, dog, man is one of those topics that, uh, people are, seem to be reluctant to talk about. And when I, when you first told me that you had a dog, man experience and I asked you to, you know, talk about it with me. Uh, and you said, yeah, I was, I was actually surprised because most people are like, nah, I'm not really, <laughs> I don't really don't want to talk about that. Uh, but have you told anybody else about this as far as like, you know, cause I know you're, you know, at the OBC a lot. Uh, have you talked about it there at all with anybody? Yeah, I, I did. And actually I talked a lot more in depth to, um, when I went up to Lauren Coleman's event, the uh, International Cryptozoology Conference, and I spoke with uh, Linda Godfrey up there, and she is like a big dog yeah. dog man author. And I don't know if you're familiar with Linda, but um, she's got quite a few books on the subject. And uh, I actually did a drawing for her and um, you know gave her my story. That's really interesting. One of these days, I wouldn't mind to see uh, you try sculpting something about what you saw. I, I definitely am going to uh, carve a dog meal one of these days. Um, the way that a dog is shaped, it's harder to uh, get the everything, the legs and everything in proportion. Or like, you know, you're carving a, a Bigfoot straight up and down where the dog is almost laying down. You know, yeah. where you'd have to lay the log down that way or something. And once I get my shop, I'll be able to do all kinds of where I can add the arms on the Bigfoots and make them look, you know, a lot more lively and things like that. Um, but I'm definitely going to carve a dog man, and we're going to be carving uh, some Mothman for the Mothman uh, convention this year. Well, that's really cool, man. I, I, I'm i going to be heading out to OBC this year, hopefully, and uh, I definitely want to oh, yeah. uh, meet up with you and just talk to you in person again and stuff. But, um, you know, you're... Bigfoot carvings are, they're really cool. They're really, really cool. And uh, I know Dave told me that he was purchasing one off you and he, like, he called me back. He's like, so excited. And, uh, you know, yeah. that carving definitely found a good home. You know that Dave's a huge collector. Uh, uh, I know. It was, it was an honor to have him have one. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, uh, he just, every once in a while, he'll, he'll call me and just tell me, like, 10 different things that he had just bought and stuff. And he's just a huge collector. He, and, and the funny yeah. thing with Dave is that he wasn't ever really into uh, Bigfoot before his experience, but since then right. it's just like blown up for him. And he's just like, he needs to collect things and it's really cool. But I wanted to, you know, give you an opportunity. 
Uh, I know you don't have a website, but how could people get a hold of you if they're if they're interested in checking out what you do and stuff, and maybe purchasing something? Uh, they could just reach out to me uh, on uh, Facebook and a private message to Snuffy DiStefano and or, or add me on Facebook. Uh, let me know what you're interested in, and uh, uh, you can always look through my pictures on there and see uh, uh, the Bigfoots that I've made. I've got them in uh, uh, three different museums now. I got one up, uh, probably three of them up at the Cryptozoology uh, Museum in Maine, Portland, Maine. I have a couple down in uh, the Expedition Bigfoot Museum down in Georgia, Cherry Tree, Georgia, I believe, and uh, they're opening another one down there. And so people are coming from all over. I got them in California. I got them in Ohio. I got them in New York. I got them. I don't even know how many states we're in. We're in a lot. Yeah, well, uh, I I know why because it, the stuff that you have is really cool because it's it's uh, it's unique and they're huge. I mean, you make smaller ones too, and I say smaller one like what two three feet, but also I've stood next to the ones that are like eight nine ten feet tall. I mean, these things are huge, and if you're a huge collector and you would be interested in that, definitely reach out to Snuffy and uh, talk to him about getting your hands on one of them. But uh, Snuffy man, I really appreciate you sharing your dogman experience. It's definitely something I wanted to talk to you about. Thank you, Tony. All right, brother. You take care, all right? You too. Thanks again. All right. Well, I want to thank Snuffy again for coming on the show. I really do appreciate Snuffy. Next up, we have Carl coming on the show. And Carl is going to talk to us about his experience of spiritual enlightenment that led to demonic attacks where he was being choked by demons, things like that. You don't want to miss this interview. So let's get into it right now. Okay, tonight I have Carl coming on, and Carl's actually in Australia, and I'm in Pennsylvania, which means he's 14 hours ahead of me. How you doing, Carl? Yeah, good, Tony. How are you? I'm doing well, man. I, you know, always arranging, you know, out of country interviews can be tricky with time zones, and so right now it's 8:30 in the morning my time, and what is it, 10:30 at night your time? No, nine thirty actually. Nine thirty. Okay, uh, gotcha. yeah, I'm on the I'm on the west coast, so we're three hours behind Sydney. So it's a big country. So there's different time zones everywhere in Australia. So yeah, yeah. but it's a Saturday, so I'm you know like we stay up till late on a Saturday night. So I'm looking forward to this. That's for sure. Awesome, man. Yeah, I, I'm looking forward to it as well. Now we got your email. Uh, I don't know. I think it was last year sometime to, around Christmas time, and. Uh, you had some just real brief things you wanted to share in the email, but the more we started talking here before the interview, the more details there are that are coming out. And so if you would, before you get into the actual encounters, you know, kind of paint the picture for, for the audience like you were with me on how uh, things developed to the point where you had these experiences. Okay. Yeah, no worries. Um, well, ever since I was little, um, I've always been into mysteries and um, ghosts, UFOs. Even when I was six, seven years old, I remember um, my grandfather. No, it was actually it was actually my uncle who came up to me, and uh, my nana had just died. And he came up to me and he tried to explain to me that I wasn't going to see my nana anymore, and she was in heaven, and and things like that. And it really upset me and I was it, from that sort of day forward I, I always thought what what is beyond when we die because I not so, I'm not going to see my nana again and and it was just an um, like surreal experience not to see my nana and it just got me thinking when I was even young so ever since then you know I was into mysteries ghosts you know you 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 go towards those sort of things because you know, you you hear about ghosts and people t- say that they're the spirits of dead people, of deceased people. And so I started resonating with all the books out there to do with ghosts and things like that, mysteries. And my mum would buy me books to do with mysteries and, um, you know, I'd read them from back to front and I'd like the pictures, you know, and because uh, you're young, you love the pictures. Sure. And, yeah, and it was it was something that took my interest. But as time went on, 
I uh, sort of, you know, you get into being a teenager and, and these things sort of drop off a little bit. Like you said, you get interested in girls and sports and and other things. And then I started traveling and, and um, but I was still always interested in those sort of things. If I had a book, it was always a book to read, say on a plane or in a train or something like that. It was always to do with some sort of mystery, uh, UFOs or things like that. And so these this went on and on. I met my partner uh, and my wife now that probably around 28. And, um, you know, we, we've we been together since then. I'm 47 now. But everything started to take shape for me when I hit 39. You know, just before I hit 39, I was listening to podcasts and I had my own podcast going about mysteries. No one listened to it. It was just a uh, small little podcast. But around 37, 38, I started listening to a, a chap named um, L.A. Marzulli, and he was on Coast to Coast. And over here in Australia, no one knows what Coast to Coast is. But I started to listen to it, and that was the show I started listening to. And I used to enjoy it when he was on. And, and he started to talk about um, aliens as demons and it really you know i thought well nah that can't be right because i used to like i said to you before i used to go to a motel and see the bible and i used to just feel, think it was a book of words so i would there was a cabinet there the bible was there i'd open it up i'd quickly skim through it there was no interest in me whatsoever in it none and I just put it back and I just think, well, you know, aliens are the ones that invented us. We're from aliens. Aliens had to have done it, you know, because there's pictures and there's all these little things saying, pointing towards aliens. There's Area 51 and there's everything uh, sort of pointing towards uh, alien intervention, you know. And so as I was listening to Ali Marzulli and I used to listen to his shows and that, I sort of went off at about, you know, 38. And when I hit 39, just before this experience happened to me, I was sort of into money. Um, I was on, in the share market. I was doing options. And I was so obsessed with money and, and material things. We moved up to a semi-rural place in Perth, which is in Western Australia, um, and it was sort of, you know, it had to do with me investing and everything had to do with money. And so I was doing the share market. Everything else was obsolete. Nothing else mattered to me but making money. And one day I was sort of like, I went outside. This, I can remember this clearly. I went outside and I looked up at the sky and this was night time, and where I lived, it was sort of dark, and there was you could see the stars, no lights around. It's really a nice place to look up at the stars. And I, I looked up and I said, "If there's anyone out there, just let me know." You know, and I said this just thinking, "Oh yeah, why did you say that for?" You know, because for for no reason, I've just said that. And I don't know. It was like. Probably about a week later, I wouldn't call it, I don't know, you've heard of Paul out of the Bible. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't call it a Paul experience as in a bolt of lightning, Jesus coming down and, uh, you know, sort of straight away he knew who Jesus was. It sort of happened to me over a week. I started to get this feeling with inside of me um, that, I was sort of there was something more, and it was and it was pointing towards Jesus and and God. And I'm not ashamed to say it. You know, a lot of people these days are sort of a negative towards that sort of thing. But this was within me. It was like then I started to read the Bible, and things started to make sense. This was all happening within a week. And then as time went on, this is probably m the months went on. Everything became about Jesus. And, and God. And um, it was just, I couldn't believe it. And I, I get shivers now because here I was into money and material things. We just had our first little boy and, and he's always been special to me. And, um, and then, but money, the money side of things that I was interested in just dwindled away. 
And suddenly it was just Jesus, the Bible, everything, history, everything I could get my hands on. I used to be, I used to listen to um, like songs that had sort of like the uh, the Jesus songs, and it used to get me so welled up, and like I was almost in tears. And I used to think, how can I love someone that I've never seen? And that's Jesus, you know. And I and it was just amazing. I was I was sort of my it was the Holy Spirit, obviously, you know, coming with inside of me and 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 sharing him with me and i was just so overwhelmed i used to everything was about jesus and and when you first become a christian you sort of become sort of annoying to everyone (laughs) yeah yeah. um and if it happens like what happened to me i was suddenly everything's about jesus and i would go to up to everyone at work and i would say you know and i had that real sort of well, infant sort of knowledge of God. And I would go up to people at work and say, you know, God is real. He loves you and, and things like that. And people would look at me like I had two heads. And and I was going up and and they would sort of say, they didn't want nothing to do with me at all, at all. And, um, you know, I started to go to church. And I noticed in church as well, this was the church down the road from me, that I was so on fire and I would sit there and listen to the sermon and then people would, the sermon would be finished and then people would get up and start talking amongst each other. And they would talk about lawn mowing and what they're doing for the rest of the day. All I wanted to talk about was Jesus and God. And I had this really huge feeling to talk about. And I got so disappointed that no one was talking with me about it, you know, because everyone was too interested in everything else. And, um, and I, I just wanted to talk. So I just kept on with people and kept on. But the experience I had after that was sort of it made me think that there, there is an evil side out there. And, and it gave me sort of, uh, what would you say, it gave me the knowledge to know now that there is a dark side. And I tell you, it was one of the most harrowing experiences I've ever had in my life, and the most harrowing experience. But I've had three of them. They all happened within the year um, after I was I found Jesus. You know, or He found me. You know, so I was this the first time. It was this was the 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 actual event that happened was I can't remember exactly what I was doing beforehand but I I we were over in where I, we were living in the semi rural place and um I've taken off to my bedroom and um I've gone to lay on my bed it was probably about 7:30 at night I'd had a hard day at work and I'm tired and I'm just laying on my bed and I'm looking up at the ceiling and I'm just thinking, you know, I can't remember what I was thinking, but it would have been about God and Jesus. I know that for a fact because that's all I was thinking about at the time. And then suddenly I sort of froze and I had this feeling that there was something next to me. So I've, I've gone to look left and there's this black figure, faceless figure standing there, and it was almost as high as the ceiling. And it was on my left. And suddenly it just grabbed me around the neck and started choking me. And I couldn't move. It was it was something I'd like I've done martial arts and I've messed with a lot of strong blokes before. But whatever grabbed me around the neck, this I'd call it a shadow man, was strangling me. And I could not release myself. It was like my whole spirit and my body had just gone dead and still, and I couldn't do it. All I could do was move my eyes. And this thing, this I could feel his hands, they were cold, and they were, they were like strangling me, and I was going, uh, 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 and I couldn't say anything. I couldn't do anything. All I could do was just look at him with my eyes. They were moving towards him, and I could see him. And I know in, my, in myself I knew he was angry. He was pissed. He was angry as anything because you could. He had no facial features. He had just tall black figure, big, but he had no. But just in myself, I knew he was angry. Obviously, he was strangling me. But just when I could see him, you could just see there was there was hate and anger. 
I, I couldn't see it like any facial features, but just know it was resonating off him. And he was strangling me. And then suddenly, you know, and I'm thinking, I'm going to die here. You know, I'm not, I'm going to die. He's, he was more and more putting his hands around my neck and it was sort of tightening and tightening. And these hands, I tell you, they were like a death grip. They, I'd never felt anything like this and I don't think I ever will. And suddenly with inside of me, I had a thought in my mind and it didn't come out of me verbally, but it came in like a telepathy. And, it, and it, it, he, something said to me, tell him that you've got Jesus. You've got Jesus. So suddenly I just gone, uh, I'm sort of like uh, that. And I'm, and in my telepathy sort of way, I've gone, I'm not scared of you. I've got Jesus. And I've looked up at him and he just sort of looked at me and just melted away. He just, it was just like, you know, the Wicked Witch of the West on The Wizard of Oz. He sort of just, it's just melted away. And I've got up straight away. He's gone, you know. I've got up straight away. I've run up to my wife. She was on the computer at the time. I said, guess what happened to me? I said, this figure was standing there strangling me, and she's looking at me like, you're a freak, you know. I'm saying, no, no. And she could see the fear in my eyes and the fear that I was, you know, telling the truth. And she knows when I say something, I, I am not going to bullshit her, you know. I'm going to tell her the truth, right? you know. And, and um she really didn't ask many questions, and it, this stunned me, you know, and it made me think that, and I can't really think of, you know, at the time I'm thinking, I know why he's here because everything's about God in my life, and I could just feel it with him as well, and I've got the Holy Spirit with inside of me, and he hates that. And I was into UFOs, and like you said before when we are talking before, um, L.A. Marzulli alerted, like saying that he said that UFOs are demons, and and you know I was into that, but I never thought they were demons. I just thought they were our creators. This was before I had the experience with Jesus and that, and um, you know. So the way I think that he, firstly, he hated the fact that obviously the Holy Spirit or or I I'd, I'd gone towards God, and also the fact that I dropped that thinkings of that the aliens were our creators, I just felt it inside of me that that's a reason why he was, I'd say he sort of, I've lost the way he would have thought or this demon would have thought was that he's lost someone that he had. And now I've gone on to the good side and I've, even though I was sort of ignorant of the actual, um, the evil side. I thought that was the good side. The aliens were our creators and that. But then with Jesus and the, what was inside of me and what I felt, I knew that aliens were demons. And this experience happened to me. It was, it was, I haven't had that sort of physical experience where I've seen the actual entity um, since then, but I've had others which were just as bad, but in a different way. Um, but that was a, a a visual, you know, and it was something that really shocked me, and it just confirmed to me that um, more confirmed that my faith in God is really it, it's all I need to get away these evil entities, these demons, and 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 things like that. Because when I said that about Jesus, it just melted. It melted. It was like the hands went off me and it melted, just melted away and it released its grip and it was gone. And, you know, that really did uh, stun me, but it also confirmed to me that, you know, we're the human beings or people in general up against it. You know, th there is a evil side trying to fight against God and Jesus. And, and I know God controls everything and he controls, but I'm not sure whether or not God was to test my face, but the way, that it came into me that Jesus, I what I said about I'm not scared of you, I've got Jesus, it wasn't from me. It was like it was put into me to say, it, like a telepathy. It was I just said it and it was just like it was put into me. I didn't think it. It was just came into me and I and then it was it was said like in my head and he melted. 
So it was really quite weird and, and it sort of confirmed to me exactly we have an evil side. And then I've been looking online and see that people had the same experiences and they have, but I, I haven't heard of anyone actually actually seen physically being strangled like I was, you know, and um, I reckon if I didn't have Jesus and I didn't have that in my head, I would have been dead by now because the way this thing was crushing my neck, it was it would have been over for me, you know, and so I'm, you know, I'm glad I got Jesus and I'm glad that I've got, you know, um, that knowledge because it would have been over for me, but I don't think he would have attacked me anyway because, um, you know, I was probably on his side before all this happened. So, yeah, that was that was the first experience, you know. So this shadow figure that you experienced choking you, was it – was it very much physical? It, it's hard to explain, you know. It's like, I don't know, it, it was physical. Looking at it, I could see him. I could see him. He was next to me. I moved my eyes. I couldn't move my body, but I could move my eyes, and I could uh, and nothing. It was like I'd been into a straitjacket and in shock. And, and people will say, oh, that's just that sleep paralysis and stuff that no this was not sleep paralysis you know this was something physical more physical and i could see visually see the figure you know and in myself i could feel he was angry as hell and then when he put his uh, his, his his hands around me it was a weird feeling it was like he was strangling me not sort of like my flesh but my insides you know like and I was not breathing. It was like his hands were around me, but it was more my spirit or something with inside of me he was crushing. And, you know, wow. I, I, didn't, I didn't have any marks on my, my neck. I had none of that. Nothing happened like that. It was like the thing that was inside me, my spirit or whatever, you know, I, I, the more I read the Bible, you know, I'm not sure that it was the Holy Spirit within me or whatever, but this thing was killing me. And I don't know what it was killing. And, and as I came to know in the experience I had in the next two experiences, which were very similar to each other, uh, down the track, um, it's, you know, these things can get hold of you and they can, you know, I don't know if, if it's a testing from God. You know, they say God doesn't test you, you know, in these. But I know he did Solomon and things like that. So, and Job. you know, yeah, and Job and things like that. But like. The next two experiences were a completely different experiences. They were, they were unique, to, and and it really did, um, you know, confirm to me that these evil entities can take your body over and make you feel like you're nothing, you're no one. You, they can make you feel like you know. So when I say, when you say that, was it a physical? It was physical, but it was not physical. It was, it was, I was not breathing. I was getting crushed. I could see him, but it was not like his hands were around my neck as in my flesh. It was more my spirit, but it was still giving me the same effect of me not being able to breathe and me feel like I'm dying. So it was a real weird experience. And That's it was just something, yeah, it was just something that, but, and then when I spoke, when I communicated to him, it was like a telepathy thing. It was like it was in my head. And as soon as I, my eyes went towards him and I said that in my telepathy way, he melted away. And I got straight up and I ran out to my wife and that was it, you know. And, you know, like I say, no facial features. And I've heard, like I've read online about these shadow people. There's a guy with a hat. I had nothing like that. This thing was huge. It was all black and there was no sort of, there was no distinguishing features. It was just black. But you could tell in myself, I could tell he was pissed and angry. And this was before he just lurched on me in my neck. But he had me in like some sort of trance, bang. I don't know what was going on, but lucky for lucky I had that because I tell you what, he that saved me when I said that. It was amazing how he, he just melted away. And it just confirmed to me all these people that say, use Jesus. Use Jesus, you know, if you have Jesus, use him as your way of letting these evil spirits go on away. That just confirmed to me because I listened to Ali Marzulli. There was another guy that I used to listen to who had 
all these people stand up and had been abducted by aliens and they use Jesus as some sort of reference and saying Jesus is with me and they all melted away, they went away. And I used to think, ah, oh, that's that's crap. You know, this was before I got saved or whatever. And and um yeah, and it just confirmed to me these people are telling the truth because it happened exactly happened to me. And um it just made me listen to these people a little bit more and 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 sort of know what they're talking about. So yeah, it was it was one of those experiences that I, I don't want to go through again, but it just confirmed to me that you know we're up against it right. you know um well, so yeah what happened next like i mean you had another uh, had two more experiences uh so two, two similar ones. yeah these were harrowing for me um uh different experiences um it was we'd moved house actually it was probably about a year on about eight a, a year on i think it was around a year on and we'd moved house back into the suburbs from the rural area i had nothing really happen i was still really big into Jesus and reading a lot and everything was about Jesus and that. And, 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 um, we moved back to our, we had a rental house that we were renting out and we moved back to it. And, um, and I was suddenly, um, I had a business, uh, proposition to me over in India, um, to do with indoor sports. And so I, I flew over there and um, we set up a business deal to do with an indoor sports arena in Hyderabad. And um, so I flew back over home after I'd set up the first bit of deal. After I'd, everywhere I was going, I was talking to the people like the lepers on the street and talking about God and giving them money and, and doing all these things. And, and, and um, that was part of the reason I wanted to go to India. And then, but when I came home, I was scheduled to go again uh, within a day or two, and I was really looking forward to it. And I was listening to different things about different podcasts, everyone's different take on Jesus and whatever else. I just used to love to listen to it. And one day, you know, I was this was a weird experience. It was like something just come out of me, and it just. It was just like all the goodness was drained out of me. And it was one of these, I'd never felt like this before. I, it was like the Holy Spirit had left me, right? And not just left me, but left me in a worse state than I was before he was there. It was like, and then these demons had taken over my body. I looked at my daughter. This was happened in a day. Right, I looked. At, I looked at my daughter, and I looked at my son, and I had this feeling like demons were in my body, you know. And I didn't have any good feelings whatsoever. I looked at my daughter and my son, and I had hate for them. After having love for them, and I could feel these presences within my body. It was like my blood had just turned to coal and black, and I wanted to commit suicide. This come on to me. This is not a depression thing. I don't have depression. I was so happy that I said to my I said to my wife, I said, listen, there's something that's come into me that's made me feel so like I want to kill myself. And I'm looking at Georgia and Luke, my son and daughter, like they're nothing to me, like I hate them. And I'm looking at you like I hate you, right? And I'd lay on my bed. I, this is with all in a day. This happened over two days, actually. This is the first time. and. I rang up India and I said, I'm not coming. And my partner over in India, he said to me, what are you talking about? I said, and he was a Muslim, so I used to talk to him about Jesus and stuff. And he said, I said, the Holy Spirit has left me and I feel like I've got ice and coal going through my, and it was really upsetting. I looked at my kids like they were dead to me and I wanted to commit suicide. I went to work that day and I was just depressed and people were going, what's wrong with you? And I'd look at the guy and I I say to the guy next to me, I said, I think I'm going to kill myself. And I could feel inside of me this, these, like I was not the person I was, you know, it just like, it just left me and something had, had come into me. And, and so I went home after work and the same thing. And it was coming 
the next day, and I went to sleep, fell, I didn't go to sleep all day. I was so tired, I mean, all night. I stayed up all night just looking up at the ceiling thinking I should kill myself now or thinking that I should go and kill my kids. That's the thoughts I was having. And I'd never had these thoughts ever in my life. Like I said, my family and my kids are the most special thing to me in my whole life. And I, I, I always love, always. But that's the feelings I was having. And I could feel something with inside of me that was taking me over and giving me these feelings. And I, I didn't know how to get out of it. You know, I got up in the morning and I didn't go to work that day. And I rang up India again. I said, I'm confirming I'm not coming. And I didn't know how to get out of this. You know, it was just like, it was, it was demon presence. It was like eight or nine demons or something had come into my body and they were messing with me, you know, and I didn't have that loving feeling of Jesus anymore. I couldn't feel like that. And I, I, I don't know what I could do. So what happened was that I was sitting there praying and, and praying to God, what's going on? I was crying. I was laying there and I was crying my eyes out. My wife was looking at me like, who is this freak? You know, he's one minute he's happy, the next minute he's he's sad and he's crying his eyes out. And I was swearing at her, get out of my room and and all this stuff, you know. And I was really praying to God, what have you done to me? What have you done to me? Why why have you done this? You know, what have, why why do you feel why do I feel like this? And and like I said, something with inside of me, right? Again, another voice or a telepathy thing said to me, start listening, go on the, go like, Doc didn't say go, listening to Christian music, start talking and being happy about Jesus, right? So I went online and I was still in that really terrible, disgusting feeling and I put on Christian music and, and there was this particular song that came on and I sat there crying my eyes out looking at this song, crying, crying. But as I was crying, I kept repeating the song. So I'd have it on YouTube and I would press repeat and I'd listen to it again, still crying my eyes out, still thinking I want to kill myself. But then as I was doing it more and more, it was like something started to lift, you know, and, and these evil thoughts started to lift. And within probably about an hour of me listening to this song over and over again, like it was like I was counteracting what was inside of me with joy and happiness to do with Jesus by singing and and kept singing and kept singing and and it just lifted and suddenly I felt it lifted I could feel myself back again and I ran up I ran up to my kids and I it's back it's back I'm back again you know and I was jumping up and down and I was I was happy again and I was saying, Jesus, thank you, God. I was, I was really thanking God for what he'd done for me and, 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 and all the happiness had come back to me. And I was loving my kids again. This was all happened within two days. Rang up India and saying, I'm coming now. I'm coming to India. So that's exactly what happened to me. And suddenly, you know, I was thanking God and I was on my knees praying, thanking him. And I rang my friend up in India and say, I'm coming again. And, and I was all happy. And my wife's looking at me like, he's a freak. This guy, <laughs> what's wrong with this guy? You know, one minute he's like, and, and, but I explained to her what had happened to me. Like, I, I think that I've had demons take over my body. The Holy Spirit's moved out of my body. And, and it was worse. It's like, all the goodness. I, th I do feel even people who aren't Christians, we still have something within inside of us that keeps us in some sort of happiness, you know, or, or some sort of spirit or, or within us that is God given. You know, it was really a terrible experience. And I had that happen to me twice. The same experience happened to me. The first time was the worst time. The second time, exactly the same, same sort of experience. Happened to me the same thing, and I uh, and it, it wasn't any worse than the first time, but it happened to me again. And I don't know whether or not it was because I was listening to things that God doesn't approve of, or you know, Christian things. I'm not sure. I just don't know why. You know, as a human being, you, you only know so much, and I I can't read God's mind. But uh, you know, as soon as I started to listen to that Christian music which I don't listen to regularly, this is just all of a sudden I was told to do it and, and, and I did it and it just lifted everything.
So it was, it was like I say, I don't have depression. I never had depression. I've, I, I do get a little bit upset now and again, but I don't get – that was a different experience. That was like something had just taken over me. And I couldn't see anything physically, but it was within me, you know. And yeah. so, yeah. That's really interesting. You know, I, I, people experience some weird things when it comes to, like, their faith and things like that. And I've heard, I've heard of things with, of what you just described and stuff. And, and to be honest with you, I don't know what to make of it, you know, when it comes to, mm. you know, reasoning or anything like that. Like if, if you were to be saying to me, what was that? Help me. I'd be like, I don't, I don't know. Like, <laughs> cause I don't, I just, no, I, I just don't no. know. And, uh, you know, talk, talking to several other people and things like that, it, it's, I find it very interesting though, like what, what people go through when it comes to their own, uh, personal faith. And there, clearly, I think we could both agree that there is a battle going on to this day for you because clearly something hadn't given up yet on trying to consume you. And mm. so you, you're, you're a Christian, you're following Jesus, and yet you still had a problem because clearly something wasn't get you gave up on them but they hadn't given up on you yet and so uh yeah i find it i find it interesting yeah well like i said uh, you know like i was saying like um but god had to let that no i wouldn't say let that happen to me but he he would have had to have it was a testing of faith maybe i don't know but uh, i know if he didn't want this to happen to me it wouldn't have happened um um because you know, he's powerful. There's nothing more powerful than him. This was an experience I had, and I tried to rationally think about why. And I was because I was listening to this, I was listening to this person talking about God, which could be wrong. But no one knows exactly, no one has the truth except for God and Jesus have the truth, you know. And so, you know, I can't go and say to someone, oh, what you're listening to is wrong. Because I don't know if it's right. I, I, I interpret what I think is right, but it's, it's not my, my point to go and say to someone who's also a Christian, what you're listening to is wrong. There's some things that I, I believe that are, are very obvious, you know, that people get wrong, but it's not my – because I'm then I feel like I'm some sort of – who do I think I am by telling these people that I'm sort of above them and I know everything, which I don't. You know, so I don't know, but I do know that God, if he didn't want that to happen, it wouldn't have happened. Like I said, it happened twice. And I know that if it wouldn't have, because the evil spirits aren't as powerful as God. I know that. And demons, it's proven when I had that experience with that shadow man with Jesus, they melt away. If, but if they're given the opportunity and, and God has a reason for them to have the opportunity to use them, he will. And he used them that day on me and and, and that other time as well. And, um, you know, since then, I've had, you know, I've had, I've sort of, since then, I, I, I feel like I've sort of drifted a little bit um, in a way. Um, I sort of drifted away to what I was, you know, when you first get the Holy Spirit and you're very strong and, and that. But I'm starting, I, I miss that. I really miss that the way I was. But a lot of people don't miss the way I was. But I still <laughs> love Jesus. And I still love God, and I still carry on. And I, but I don't read the Bible as much because I, I, I know a lot of it now, and I can just recite it in my head. But I listen to little things. But then the people I hang around as well don't aren't so much into God. But I, I do know that God is there with me. It's just not as strong as it was before, and I miss that. I miss the fact that that was so strong. And I feel like, am I doing something wrong? Because I know I am doing something wrong. There's things that I do that I know that God wouldn't approve of, you know, And um, but nothing too bad, but things that normal people do. But it's just things that I, you know, get angry and, and, and get upset and, and do stuff like that. But I miss that real strong feeling. But then I couldn't keep going like that because if I kept going like that, they would have thrown me in a nut house. And I would have been sitting in some nut house, yelling at the prison guards. You know, you got to find Jesus. You know, so I'm no good when I'm so strong like that. I'm better when I'm sort of more subtle. And I, I find someone that wants to just subtly talk about it now. And I will always back Jesus up. And if I hear it and I let my ears prick up, and someone's bagging him, I'll go over there and I'll I'll talk to him about it. And and I'll always. No one will ever 
ever get in my way and say that God's not real or Jesus is not real and say to me and b- me to say back to them, or, you know, like I say, if I'm in a group of people and someone mentions this God and Jesus in a negative way, not like I'm some sort of prude, but if they say, um, like, you know, they'll look at me and say, you, you're into Jesus, you're into God, you know, how could you say he's real? You know, they'll say stuff like that. I won't prompt it. They'll prompt it. Oh, oh, never, ever, never, ever will I back down from what I know and, and who I love. And I still love Jesus sure. as much as I did, just as not as strong where I'm telling the whole world. I think I've matured, you know. So, um, yeah, I but mean, when, yeah. like, you know, when it comes to that whole thing, like, like people have to understand that you go through ups and downs. There's going to be peaks and there's going to be valleys in your faith uh, with whatever it is. I don't care if you're Muslim, Christian, Hindu, whatever, like, like the, like you're going to have peaks and you're going to have valleys. And, and it doesn't mean that you're not a, a Christian. It doesn't mean that you, you know, no longer believe in Jesus just because you're yeah. in a valley. I mean, the, the only qualifier for Christian to be a Christian, it, it's labeled out in Romans 10, I think it's verse 9 or not verse 10 or something. It's just, you know, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's exactly. the only qualifier. That. that is the only yeah. qualifier. Everything else is post salvation you you do certain things because now you have Jesus in your heart and you want to do it like there's a transformation that comes in but that is the only qualifier and and if you can say that you i believe i would see you in heaven you know so yeah. like mm. like that that's that's for me that's the bottom line and you know uh people tend to put these rules in place that like for instance the pharisees in the bible they made up rules to help follow the 10 commandments so god gives the 10 commandments and they're making up rules that are supposed to theoretically help follow the 10 commandments but in the process they made that law and if you don't follow what they tell you to follow you're in trouble mm. and, and, and yeah. that's that's not of god god no. right here is saying just confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved. That yeah, is I it. agree. I agree. So, um, I, I believe that you can't say that without the help of God, but you know what I mean? I do believe God has to give you that to say that because, like you say, from the heart and from your mouth, you know, because you know beforehand, like me beforehand, I would never even think of that, you know. I would never even mention, uh, what's God, you know, who's Jesus? But uh, like I say, he gave that to me in my heart and I've said it, you know, and and I feel it in my heart and the way I say it. And that's how it's confirmed because I think people just can't say that without feeling it. Well, Carl, I really appreciate you coming on and sharing some of this stuff with with me. And uh, just before we get out of here, I just want to ask you one more question about your first experience, because uh, it, it kind of reminded me a little bit about a previous show. So uh, I can't remember the number, number of the show, but I believe it was called uh, Bedroom Visitations. And David comes on the show and he shares how he wakes up to seeing two entities. And I can't remember if he actually described them as greys. But he remembers mm-hmm. seeing two entities in his room pulling him off the bed while, and his wife's there too, like she's sleeping. And he described it as it was physical, but he said it felt like they were also pulling something out of him. And exactly. It, yeah. And the way you described it, it seemed like it was physical, but it was also trying to crush something within you. And David yeah. described it as, I think he said as either, like he felt like it was pulling his spirit or his soul out of him. Uh, is that kind of like a similar? Exactly. Okay. Exactly the same. He was crushing me with his hands, but it was like it was not physical as in someone doing it physically, a strong man doing it physically. It was like it was he 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 pushed through my my neck and grabbed something else and it was pulling it and 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 crushing that with inside of me, you know? And like I said, it was all it was all like a real weird experience when it came to that. It was not I wasn't hurting me. I didn't feel pain. I felt like I was dying, felt like my spirit was dying, like I was about to die, but it didn't feel any pain. 
but I felt the strength in the hands and just the evilness in his hands and it was it was crushing something with inside of me that wasn't physical. It was so weird. It was it was so weird. And he was I could see him in my my eyes looking left and he was looking at me and I could just tell he was evil to the core and he was hate. He had hate for me and hate for everything that I'm about. Because and without any facial features, I could just feel that. It's a weird thing, you know. It's like loving Jesus and you don't know how you you love someone that you've never seen before or had any physical contact. It's like the same thing, you know. It's just like yeah. there's, this, there's, there's something going on inside of us. Even people who aren't Christian, who have these experiences that still have that. Was he a Christian, that guy you mentioned? Yes, yes, he is. He was. Much. Yeah, it seems to happen to a lot of Christians, but I know that it, it as like reading online and reading YouTube um, comments, it seems to happen to a people who aren't Christian, and they still have have had some physical experiences where they've had similar experiences, and it seems to be that we all have some sort of spirit inside of us, no matter if we're Christian or not, that these things can um, the target, and they do target. And, um, you know, we don't know whether or not someone who's ended up dead or have died overnight, no one knows why, these things might have got hold of them and they didn't have the answer like me and me, I did, and they've just passed away. We just don't know, you know. So the way I was feeling, I thought, well, I've only got about 10 seconds to live. That's the way I felt and the way he was crushing me. It was like, I can't breathe. But it was like not a physical breath that I could breathe. It was just inside of me. It was just, right. like I said, with that, that, the same guy, it was weird. It was absolutely weird. And um, like I say, it was the most powerful thing. There's nothing I could have done within myself. But just those words melted him away. And, you know, it's the same experience as that other guy. You know, it's a weird feeling. It's physical, but it's not. Right. It feels everything feels physical, but it's not physical. Right. It's it's weird, like the telepathy thing. You know, I didn't mention, I didn't move my mouth, but my mind told him. And as the ex- people I read online, they have the same. They don't verbally. A lot of people don't verbally say it. They just verbally. They just mentally think it, and these things melt away. So you know, yeah, what is that? It, what is that? It's no? a very common thing, and and it's you know, uh, we're we're probably going to get the answers one day when we're we're good and gone. But right now, it's a mysterious thing. And I and Carl, I just I just want to say thank you very much for coming on and sharing with us. So I really appreciate yeah, it's it. It's been my pleasure. It's been my pleasure. I'm glad to have someone to actually listen to me for once, you know, instead of <laughs> turning away and going, "You're a freak," or you know, "What sort of person are you?" and looking at my wife and going, "How can you be with this fella?" You know, but you know, you know, she knows what I'm like. So, you know, we've been through a lot. So, you know, sure. um, yeah, and I, I'm really happy to be on here. And thanks very much for everything. No Absolutely, worries. Absolutely, man. No problem. Uh, you take care, okay? Okay, mate. No worries. Hey, thanks for watching The Confessionals on YouTube. If you like what you heard, hit the subscribe button, hit the share button, and hit the like button. That would be a great help to me. And if you want more of The Confessionals on a weekly basis, every Thursday I come out with a special show just for members on my website. So if you want to check that out, go to theconfessionalspodcast.com, hit the join button, and become a member today. And every Thursday, you'll get a new show, and you can binge on previous shows, which there's almost a 100 of them. So if you love the show, go ahead and check it out. But thank you very much for being here on YouTube and checking out the channel.